I I forgot to turn off this music again. This is a technical difficulty stream. Oh, okay. So, so we're we're jumping right back in. We have one more problem to go, and as I said, we will not even do it fully. So, as I see in chat, there are no pro there are no questions to the problems that we've already done. So let's continue to this one. This was the long and difficult problem from problem set one. So it was meant to be difficult. Very few of those, very few of you solved it. But I think I've seen one or two quite, quite decent solutions. So this problem dealt with Kyle's model with the risk averse uh, dealer. So it combined Kyle's model with the stall model that we had in the very beginning. So just a quick refresher. I hope that these by now are already, you know, ingrained in your memory. So unlike parlor model that we never really revisited, I made a lot of references to Kyle's model, to Stoll's model throughout the lectures, so I hope that these are these do come to memory when I mention them. But a quick refresher on Kyle's model. We have one asset with fundamental value V, which is distributed normally. We have one informed trader who chooses the trade size. Uh, we have some number of noise traders who submit a random order, which is also distributed normally with a zero mean. And we have competitive dealers who provide a price schedule, depending on the total order flow of uh, noise traders and the informed trader together. So competitive dealers provide this price schedule and the price, all trades happen at that final price. So informed trader does not know the exact price when he's submitting his order because the price he gets will also depend on what no, how noise traders decide to trade. So in this problem, our representative dealer was assumed to be risk averse as a deviation from the standard Kyle's model. So we assume that the dealer has mean variance preferences, meaning that this is the utility function that he maximizes. It's given by the expectation of future wealth minus the variance of this future wealth times the risk aversion coefficient. And we assume that the dealer has some initial asset holding Z0 and also some initial cash holding C0, but this cash holding does not does not matter for literally anything, so you can forget about that. Just the initial asset holding. So the way we proceed with Kyle model is we just look for linear equilibrium straight away. So we And this is what we'll do in this problem as well. So we are looking for a linear equilibrium where the order size of the informed trader, x, is a linear function of the fundamental value v minus some normalizing constant x0 and the dealer sets the price according to a linear schedule so the price is linear in q the total order flow so q will be equal to x plus u and again plus some intercept p0 now, as usual, we need to determine lambda and beta to describe an equilibrium. In this problem, we also have these intercepts to determine. So they were more or less reasonable in the standard Kyle model. They were easy to guess. But now we need to actually solve for them. So I have posted the solutions to this problem on Canvas, on, on Epsilon, and those are relatively fine. And due to this, I will not go through all of this problem here and now, also because we only have half an hour left. I will go through two of the aspects that I think you are least comfortable with. I will go through parts A and C in particular. So part A, asks you to find the conditional expectation and variance of um, v conditional on q 
So to find what dealers think about the distribution of V once the dealers observe the total order flow Q. So this caused a lot of confusion. And part of it is because I was not clear about it, about how you do it in lectures. So we'll do this today uh, in greater detail. But this will be the last thing we do, the second thing we do. Because I expect that most of you will fall asleep during this one. So before you do this, before you fall asleep, let us do the other thing. So in part A, uh, we do this, we'll get back to this. In part B, you just rewrite these moments, expectation and variance of V conditional on Q, as expectation and variance conditional on P. And you even had uh, a transition formula from the price impact equation. So all you needed to do there was to plug in this into where the Q was. But let me stop in more detail on part C. So part C says, condition, considering how many units Y of the risk asset to supply to the market, the dealer takes price P as given. Argue in line with the Stoll's model that the dealer supply curve satisfies this equation. Now this is kind of the centerpiece of the Stoll's model and of this particular Kyle model with the risk conversion that we're looking at now. And I feel like you're not comfortable with uh, understanding how the dealers make their decisions in these models. And this is understandable because this is somewhat of a funky logic and it's not fully internally consistent. So let me now try to improvise and spell this logic more explicitly. So how do dealers behave in stall model slash Kyle's model with the risk aversion? So the strange part about all of this is that dealers take price P as given. This is something stated in the problem text. I just wanted to say this again and emphasize this. So even though in reality this price is determined as a function of an order flow, right? and the dealer actually posts the price schedule as a function of Q, they are at the same time take this price as given, as fixed at some given level. So this is the inconsistency in logic here that, that we employ to solve these models. Even uh, though they post the whole price schedules so basically the way we think dealers think which is crazy but we need to do this so the way we think dealers think is there is some market price P, again, fixed at some given level. How much am I willing to supply at this price? Let's say how much Q am I willing to supply at this price? meaning buy or sell. Now this question is non-trivial compared to models without risk aversion with linear utility. So if I go to third level of indentation, 
under risk neutrality, dealers were if sorry if the profit per unit of the asset was positive then they were willing to buy any amount up to infinity and vice versa if profit per unit was negative they were willing to sell any amount up to infinity they would have actually preferred to sell or buy as much as as is available uh, so under risk neutrality dealers base their decisions on per you on the expected profit per unit traded meaning they want to buy as much as possible if this profit is positive sell if this profit is negative and they are indifferent if they get zero profit per trade. Right? Now, this is no longer the case when dealers are risk averse, when they have some kind of concave utility or which otherwise um, is non linear in the expected profit. So, under risk aversion, each dealer is only willing to buy a limited amount of any risky asset a limited amount of risky asset even if profit per trade is always positive or negative strictly positive or negative on all units traded expected profit per unit uh, is Now let me write it in a bit more detail. So even if expected profit per unit is strictly positive or strictly negative for all units. Basically the idea here is that if the dealers are risk averse, they are not willing to take large risky positions. Here if the dealer buys a lot of risky asset, even if profit per unit traded is positive, so on expectation, he expects to get a lot, right? But, by, but the more he buys, the riskier his total position becomes, the larger the variance of his uh, wealth, of his future wealth becomes. So this is bad for him. And in these uh, mean variance, mean standard deviation models, there will always be this interior point, this crossing point at which the variance becomes too large, too costly to take and no longer worth this positive expected profit. So once again, for any given price, we now need to find out how much exactly are the dealers willing to supply? What is the maximal amount they're willing to buy or what is the maximal amount they're willing to sell? So this kind of decision, the answer to this previous question, yield some supply curve Q of P. So once we answer that question, we will know how much the dealers are willing to supply at any given price P. And we will then invert this to get the price schedule. P of Q. Okay, there's not a lot of margin on the right side. So that's how we solve the stall model. That's how we solve the Kyle model with risk aversion. I hope this is clearer now than it was before. Once again, this kind of logic is somewhat inconsistent, is ridiculous to think about, 
this does come from the dealers being competitive. So competitive dealers are always price takers, even if they are submitting the whole price schedules. And the timing does not really make sense in this case. So that's how you solve it. And um, to answer this question of what is the optimal amount to supply, you solve the maximization problem. So you uh, plug the wealth, the future wealth, into the dealer's utility function. That's why we need the expectation and the variance of all these things that we look at. You plug those into the utility function, you maximize it with respect to Q, and you find the answer. I think that part is relatively clear, so I will not go through that in great detail. And that is basically how you obtain this equation y of p. So here y is that q. y is the amount that dealers are willing to trade. Okay, there are three more parts to this problem. I think those are written in the solutions quite well and really for the most part these are just pure algebra. So we will not do them. And instead what we'll do is we will move back to part a. And we will see how that works. So as a reminder, in part A we needed to find out the conditional distribution of V conditional on Q. Or we only need to find the moments, but uh, let us do the whole thing. Why am I forgetting to press all the buttons today? Sorry about that. So once again, that's how you get this y of p. What we just saw was how you get y of p. y is the amount um, the amount dealers are willing to supply at price p. And then there are all the other parts of the problem that are just algebra. Going back to part A, we need to find these conditional things. Now I go back to this. I should probably keep more eye on the stream, on what I'm actually showing you. Because I keep putting the wrong things on my screen. Let us even have a new one. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we need to find distribution of V conditional on Q. The result that I tried to give you in lectures is the result that you kind of are supposed to know from your econometrics class. This is how OLS works, right? So, a reminder on OLS. If you have um, this kind of equation or whatever, if y equals beta x plus epsilon, if y and x are connected with a linear relationship and epsilon is distributed normally with mean zero and some variance, then the big conclusion of OLS is you can estimate You can estimate y conditional on x. If you know x, you can estimate what the expected y will be in the following way. It will be given by the uncon... Un My brain is melting too early today, sorry. It's given by the unconditional expectation of y plus the information that x tells you about y. So it's given by this um, covariance of x and y divided by variance of x. This is your beta. This is how you estimate this coefficient beta, because that's the part that we think are, is not known. Times 
the expectation of sorry times x minus the expectation of x so this is the kind of innovation in x conditional to uh, its, its expected value and this is kind of the new information that we do not already contain in our exam expectation so this is the big formula that i meant for you to use it's not shown anywhere on the slides so slides only present the specific version for the exact stall model and that's that's my bad i guess in this particular case we need to have expectation of v conditional on q so we just substitute all the values it's given by the unconditional expectation of v covariance between v and q divided by variance of q times q minus expectation of q now a lot of you forgot about this final term the expectation of q this is because in standard kyle's model this expectation is zero now this is no longer the case in this problem with the risk aversion because if you if we go back to the setup our informed order size is no longer centered around zero it is centered around some x zero and this has to do with the fact that uh, the dealer has some initial asset holdings at zero this will all come from that so we need to keep track of this expectation of q and we also need to compute this exante expectation of v more carefully but i think mo more of you did that correctly so this is the quick and fast way to do this and then uh, with the variance i think nothing changes compared to the lecture So this is the quick and easy way. Now let me also go through the long and painful and tedious way to do this. And not assume that you know any econometrics and let us actually derive this expression explicitly for our exact Kyle model with, um, uh, with the risk aversion. So we want to derive the distribution of this thing. We want to derive the distribution of V conditional on Q. Okay, sorry. I just I just looked at the stream again and I noticed that we have these tabs. But uh, that's the way to get rid of them. Okay, so we want to find this conditional distribution. How is a distribution described? What gives a distribution? Distribution is described by a well distribution function. You can have a CDF, cumulative distribution function. And if your distribution is well behaved enough, you can also look at PDF, probability distribution function, probability density function. So if we are sophisticated enough to know that V conditional on Q is normal, we know that this PDF exists. So let us look at that straight away. So we want to calculate this PDF of this conditional distribution. To do this, we invoke Bayes rule once again. So this PDF is the same object as a probability. So in Bayes rule we had the probability of x conditional on y is equal to probability of x and y divided by the probability of x. The point I'm making is if we substitute all of these probabilities with probability density functions, the formula will still be correct. This will be the Bayes rule for, a con for continuous variables. So let us do exactly that. So in the numerator we'll have... Can you actually see that? It might be a little too small. In the numerator we have the CDF of the joint distribution of... Sorry, this should be V and Q. So what is the probability of observing this particular v and this particular q? 
and in the denominator we'll have f of q. This should be y. I flipped the x and y compared to the formula that I had before. So in the denominator we have f of q, so this is the, the probability of observing this particular re realization of q. So this is how we will want to find this conditional PDF. Now let us find these two elements separately. Let us start with the numerator, and let us start with trying to find this uh, f of v and q. What is the joint probability? Uh, well, let us plug in the definition of q. So v is just v. v is a random variable. We know what the distribution of v is. It's normal with mean mu and some variance, sigma square v, right? What is q? q is the total order size, which is composed of order sizes of informed and uninformed investors, x and u. And then we plug in the linear strategy of the informed trader. So what is x? x is by assumption given by beta v minus x0. Let me quickly check. Yes, minus x0 plus u. So here v is a random variable. We know the distribution. u is a random variable. We know the distribution. And x is just some constant. Now, we know that v and u are mutually independent. So the probability of v taking some value v and the probability of v and u being such that the sole lower size q is given by some q. Um, yeah. Can be written as a product of the individual PDFs. So we can have the probability, the PDF of v being equal to the to some value v times the probability that u equals q minus these things. So let me write it in a ridiculous way. Let me write it like this. So this joint PDF, just to clarify, is the probability of v the variable, the random variable, being equal to some uh, some value v, so this second v is a number, and the probability of v and q as variables, as random variables, being such that this expression equals q. So we can decompose that as In the second line as the probability that v the random variable equals v the value times the probability that u the random variable equals q minus beta v plus x0 given some value v i promise that everyone will fall asleep i see the viewers dropping I keep my promises, sometimes, except when I promise to finish early. So yeah, uh, yeah, you, you're, you're welcome to um, leave if you are fine with this, with this derivation, or if you are fine with just using the formula, having no idea where it comes from, or if you remember from econometrics. In that case, I will see you next Wednesday. But I will finish this derivation for those of you who are interested. So, slowly and steadily. We have decomposed this joint PDF into the product of two independent PDFs, because u and v are independent variables. So that's the PDF of v, that's the PDF of u, conditional on v. Now, if, if we plug in the actual PDFs, the actual distributions of v and u, we will get something. Uh, so, as a reminder, if some x is normal with mean mu 
and varying sigma square, then its PDF is given by the following. 1 over 2 square root of pi times sigma squared times the exponent of minus x minus mu squared divided by sigma squared. So that's how PDF of normal distribution looks like. So we invoke this here. We have that CDF of V is given by 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared V times the exponent of minus V minus mu is our unconditional expectation of V squared divided by sigma V squared. times the second element, and this will be 1 over square root of 2 pi sigma squared u, times the exponent of minus, so we're looking at this value, minus the unconditional expectation of u, which is 0. divided by the variance of u, which is sigma squared u. So this is our joint PDF. And for the PDF of q in the denominator here, one thing you can do so we obviously want to expand what q actually is. So it's once again x plus u. And plug it in the definition of x, the assumption about x. Uh, it will be equal to beta v minus x0 plus u. So it will be the CDF of two joint variables equaling something. The proper and completely rigorous way to do this is to go through mixtures. So it will be like um, the probability, sorry, the probability that um, v is equal to some value x times the probability that u is equal to q minus beta times this value x plus x0, sorry, x is bad, uh, let, uh, let's say it's z, and you take an integral of this with respect to all possible um, values of z, dz. That's how you work with mixtures. That is really an annoying way to go. We will not go there. I hate mixtures personally. Um, so we can do it easier. We do know that the sum of two normal variables, um, yeah, we will invoke the properties of normal distribution. We know that v is normal, we know that u is normal, we know that they are jointly normal, which is important and not trivial, given that both of them are normal independently. So we know that v and u are jointly normal and independent, meaning that this sum this random variable beta v minus x0 plus u will also be normal and we know how to compute the mathematical expectation and the variance of this thing so this is the long way short way is to say that uh, q equal to this thing is distributed normally with what mean? So it's beta times the mean of v mu minus x0 plus the mean of u, which is 0. And what is the variance? So it'll be this beta squared times the variance of v 
variance of x0 is 0 plus the variance of u. So beta squared times sigma squared v plus sigma squared u. And there are no covariances here because v and u are independent. Okay? So we know that q is distributed this way. So we can just write out the PDF of this normal distribution. So we will have that f of q equals 1 over square root of 2 pi times this variance multiplied by the exponent to the power q minus the mean, so minus beta mu plus x0, all of this squared divided by the variance. This is our f of q. So now we just need to combine this f of q with this joint PDF to go back to the base rule and obtain the conditional uh, PDF of V conditional on Q. Combining F of Q and F of VQ, we get will be this huge expression divided by this slightly smaller expression. Let us see how it can go. So let us first combine the fractions, the leading fractions, and then we'll combine the remaining exponents. So with the leading fractions, we have... Let me copy them first and then I'll manipulate them straight away. Times this. So let me write the exponent of something to make sure that we have something there. And this last fraction is actually to the power minus 1. So it's the inverse. So then we have square root of 2 pi twice in the denominator, once in the numerator, so only one survives. So we'll have only one square root of 2 pi. Sigma squared v in the denominator, sigma squared u in the denominator, divided by this joint variance. So once we collect all the terms, we get no u this in the leading fraction. Not the nicest of expression of expressions, but uh, something that you can get. Okay, and in the exponents, we just need to collect all the terms, just need to add up all the terms. So we have this term from the first exponent, then minus, I forgot the square here, minus this from the second term, and plus the last one. Okay, we done did the thing, right? We found the conditional distribution of V conditional on Q. We found it CDF. It's not very telling so far. It does not, it's hard really to see that v conditional on q is normal and what its mean and variance is. I guess from this term you can guess that it will be the variance, but it is not yet a very reliable guess, right? Because we can have more multipliers kind of coming out of this exponent. So how do we find the mean and variance of this? Recall that if x is normal, then we should have x in this form in the exponent. So 
so it should be scaled its square should be scaled by its variance and it should be a full square with some mean so let us try to find mu and sigma such that v can be written in this way as a full square so let us focus on the exponent in this last expression and collect terms with v what will we get so we will open the first two squares and we will leave the last one b because there are no v's in this last fraction but in the first two we will have v squared minus 2v mu plus mu squared divided by sigma squared v minus a slightly larger expression beta squared v squared minus 2 beta v multiplied by q plus x zero I also have q plus x zero squared by sigma squared u so we can ignore these last terms because they do not contain v once again so let's focus on what we have with v so this whole thing will be equal to minus v squared times what 1 over sigma squared v minus beta squared times sigma squared u plus 2v times mu by sigma squared v plus beta q plus x zero divided by sigma squared u okay we're 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 almost done i can almost promise that not much left if you can see where we go from this it's it from here it's good right so you just simplify this difference into one fraction it will be sigma squared u minus beta squared sigma squared v divided by sigma squared v sigma squared u right and then you also simplify this second term so what you will have in the very end, no, I don't want to do it this way. You'll have minus, so v squared divided by the inverse of this fraction, which is exactly this variance. So we have confirmed that this fraction actually works there should be a plus here right so this fraction is the variance of v condition on, on q and in the numerator of this big fraction we'll have so minus v squared minus 2v times the fraction in the numerator will you'll have this huge fraction in the denominator you'll have this huge fraction so i guess let me plug them in even though it will not be any more illustrative and once you simplify this huge expression which is just a little bit of algebra it's not that difficult so if you simplify this expression you will see what will be the mean so this will be the mean this expression right 
because denoting the huge term by 2v as mu and this thing as um, let's say sigma squared v conditional on q we get in the exponent minus v squared minus 2v mu divided by sigma squared again plus some more terms that we are ignoring that we have ignored successfully and you can express this as a full square as v minus mu squared divided by sigma squared and again you'll have to borrow some terms from these remaining terms the idea is that this mu squared will be exactly equal to everything that you'll have left okay we're done that's how you do it it was i guess still not as clear as i wanted as i wanted to make it but that's how you find the conditional expectation of v conditional on q if you are being rigorous if you really want to get it if you really want to get how you do it okay so that's it for today I hope you understand now why I wanted to do this last. We'll have some more problems next week, next Friday. We'll cover problem set 2 and we'll cover problems from lectures 9 and 10 on value of liquidity and Wait, did I give you something in lecture 10? I thought I did. Let's say I did. You'll find out next week and so will I. But we are meeting on Wednesday. We will continue talking about high frequency trading. And we will also begin talking about the peculiarities of public information in markets. I went over time yet again. I'm sorry, yet again. I guess by now you, you see that uh, I, have no, I have no hopes of amending this. But I'll see you next week. If you have any questions, as usual, ask them now. I imagine that there might be some questions as to how we do this last thing. But if you have questions about the previous thing, you're also welcome to ask them. And otherwise, I'll see you next Wednesday and uh, goodbye.